Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy Brock. Welcome to the third of BAFTA's 2018 International Screenwriters Lectures uh, in conjunction with uh, Lucy Gard and the JJ Charitable Trust um, on this winter evening. Uh, we are enormously honoured to be hosting uh, the internationally renowned writer and director Nicole Holfsner. Nicole's body of work from her 1991 film, short film, Angry, to 2018's The Land of Steady Habits spans nearly 30 years of acutely observed, forensically funny examinations of contemporary life, eschewing all the predictable tropes of comedy in favour of a, of a realism that is both startling and poignant, a universality from the specific. Nicole will talk, followed by a Q&A with the writer and journalist Ian Hayden-Smith, after which, as we always do, we'll open it up to the floor. So, ladies and gentlemen, Nicole Holofsener. I've never stood in front of one of, behind one of these things before, ever. Um, hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much to coming, for coming to hear me speak. Um, yeah, I'm a little nervous. I like being behind the camera. Um, but uh, this is a challenge for me, and um, I, I think it's going to work out. <laughs> I want to thank BAFTA um, for having me here. It's a really big honor. Um, I was thrilled when I got invited. So thank you so much. Um, I am going to read. I'm going to try to have some eye contact as well. <laughs> but I like having this thing here. Um, the last time I had to stand in front of an audience to tell them why I was special, I peed in my pants. <laughs> I had been proudly sharing the wonders of a cactus that my cousin had given me when I was visiting Philadelphia, and it was going well until I was peeing. The urine burned its way down my white tights and into my shiny black Mary Janes and onto the floor of my first grade classroom. Quick on my feet, I said to the class, you might be wondering why I have this water around me. You see, it was raining a lot in Philadelphia, and, now I, and I stepped in a puddle, and now my shoes leak. I was pretty confident they believed me until my best friend told me that everyone knew it was P. <laughs> so I've been invited to this prestigious event to tell you how I'm talented, and I'm afraid that while I might think it's going well, a friend of mine will politely let me know that none of you bought it because you all knew it was P. <laughs> okay, no more P talk, I promise. Um, I don't want to give advice except to say the cliche of follow your own voice, because I don't really know anything else. Um, I only know what's worked for me, and I didn't even know I had a voice until other people told me I did. Um, I'm writing what I want to write about, and if you're doing the same, and not trying to fit into somebody else's idea of what a good story is, your voice will appear, or at least it should, and it doesn't have to be autobiographical for it to be your own. I am going to try to talk about how I've taken various stages of my life and turned them into screenplays. Because if you've seen my movies, you know they're all kind of personal. Because I write about myself, I feel exposed a lot of the time. But when it works, when I feel like I've written something that moves people, whether it's funny or sad, then it's absolutely worth the exposure like standing here right now. <laughs> um, I write about my problems, my friends, my lovers, my fears, and of course, my mother. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Um, she adopted a baby black boy when she was in her 50s, so he grew up in a family of white people, mostly women. I wondered what that was like for him, and it inspired me to write Lovely and Amazing. I turned my brother into a girl for a variety of reasons. He was thrilled. <laughs> in this scene, Annie, I'm going to show you clips, by the way. Um, she feels lost among her sister's neurotic problems and walks by herself to McDonald's. Her sister, Michelle, played by Catherine Keener, is always annoyed with her 
and Annie feels like Michelle doesn't like her. Um, this is the scene actually towards the end of the movie from Lovely and Amazing. Um, yeah, my, my brother actually really loved the movie, but he was unhappy that I made him overweight. <laughs> Which at the time he kind of was. Not anymore. Um, okay, so I wrote Enough Said because I thought, you know, what if my boyfriend's ex-wife told me what his faults were or about the stuff he did that drove her crazy? Would that be valuable information or would it ruin my own perception and experience of him? Having been married before, I clearly was afraid there would be hidden parts of this new person that were eventually going to hurt me. As I continued to write, I gave the characters children who were about to go away to college and that gave them something to bond over my own kids hadn't left for college yet, but I was consumed with not wanting to let them go and not wanting to start this new phase of my life without them. The empty nest became a large part of the movie kind of inadvertently. I don't plot things out, so my scripts reveal themselves to me as I go along. So because of this, I usually end up with some shitty first drafts, but that's okay. The first draft is always the most difficult and scary, but rewriting can actually be fun. It's much easier for me to see what I'm doing once I've done it. Uh, let's see. So here, Eva and Albert have their first date before she knows anything about him. <laughs> it's so touching to watch Jim. It kind of kills me. Um, uh, so later, Albert discovers that Eva has coincidentally, but coincidentally become friends with his ex-wife, Catherine Keener, and has heard an earful, making her judge everything about him. And so it all goes to hell. That's the next clip. <laughs> Is that normal that everybody claps after a clip? <laughs> it's nice, I'll take it. <laughs> um, Sometimes writing about personal things can be cathartic, and sometimes not at all. One would think that if I write about my fears, I would be able to conquer them, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, here's another scene, I guess the last one from uh, Enough Said, um, about me taking my kids to school, basically. I cried while I was directing that scene. Um, actually, a few people, people on the crew did as well. I mean, it was just so emotional watching her performance. And I, I kind of can't even watch it now. Like, my kids have gone to school, but it's still like I'm wrecked. Um, did it lessen the drama when I actually took my kids to college? Because I shot this before. And no, it did not. <laughs> um, unfortunately, movies are movies and life is life. Um, so... Uh, I have this thing about the truth. Uh, I believe that a lot of time, a lot of the time, truth should trump manners. And can we even say that word anymore? Did he actually steal a verb from the English language? <laughs> it's like that's all anyone thinks of when you hear that. For instance, if a good friend asks if I can tell he's balding, and I can, I tell him the truth because I'd want the truth. And I assume others do, but of course that's not always the case. <laughs> If I'm insecure about something and people keep telling me I'm imagining it, like, no, no, you don't look that way, whatever. Um, and people keep telling me I'm, I, I don't feel relieved, I feel placated. And once I got a really shitty haircut, not once, but several times, <laughs> but I'll tell about once, um, and was so happy when a friend said, yeah, you got a really shitty haircut. Um, it was such a relief. Um, it was like, right? It helped that somehow someone saw what I saw and validated my feelings. It diminished its importance simply by calling it what it is. It was a tragedy, however. Um, this is from Please Give, and this really points to um, needing for someone to see what I see and to be seen. <laughs> that feels bad, right? <laughs> It's like I look fine, is this fine? Um, and then we can play the next clip because it, it's connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
So um, in my life, and if you've seen my movies, I grapple with what it means to be a good person. Um, what to give and how can be tricky and not so obvious. In the beginning of Please Give, Abby, them, asks her mom, Kate, for an expensive pair of jeans. And Kate snaps at her, telling her that there are you know, hundreds of homeless people everywhere and that she's not going to buy her teenage daughter $200 jeans, which seems reasonable, except that Abby continually watches her mother give to everyone else. Um, but she turns out to be a nice girl. Um, of course, Abby seems spoiled and obnoxious, but she's crying out for her mother to see her throughout the whole movie. It's not about money. She believes the genes will make her feel better, and eventually, at the end of the movie, Kate gets it. She realizes that giving can be an intangible thing. I'm talking less than the clips, but that's okay with me. <laughs> Thank you. On the how to be good topic, I like to volunteer and have many have had many experience. Exp I've had many experiences doing it that turned out to be completely unhelpful and even detrimental. I once, and this is just one of many. I once carried an old mentally ill woman, a woman's groceries to her apartment and gave her my number in case she ever needed anything. She left threatening messages on my phone machine <laughs> for weeks convinced I was trying to kill her. <laughs> uh, once, this was the kicker, once my mom and I went to a mental hospital on like Rikers Island to sing Christmas carols to cheer up the patients. I don't know what we were thinking, honestly. <laughs> um, Oh my God, it was so sad. It was so sad I ended up in the stairwell sobbing. I wrote this scene to make fun of my own useless and harmful attempts to be good. That's me. Um, when I got to set that day, I was mad at myself for even writing that scene because I was afraid I was gonna end up falling apart just like Kate does that I would feel so bad and only feel pity for those kids and end up sobbing in the bathroom. It was me directing a scene about my limitations while I still had those limitations. I didn't fall apart and ended up enjoying myself, but it was a very meta, whatever, the epitome of me and my movie blending together. Um, so I have this thing about truth, but I also have a thing about justice. You see, if you make movies, you can get all this shit out. <laughs> um, I should have been a judge, but even better, I'm a judgmental person who gets, to, who gets to point out how incredibly screwed up and disappointing people are in my movies. Um, I'm appalled when someone builds a huge house that looks like Bloomingdale's or Harrods next to a tiny one, blocking their light, privacy, and views. Don't they know that even before they move in, their neighbors hate them? How could they possibly rationalize their selfishness? Um, this, this one's from Friends with Money. I wrote that part of the movie so that those kind of people will hate themselves. <laughs> um, when my kids were young, other moms sent their nannies with their kids to play. So they didn't know where their kids went. This scene from Friends with Money is about me wanting to call people out on their obliviousness. Sometimes when I get caught up in the pleasure of deep moral outrage, I can't see what's right in front of me, that the problem is me. Uh, next scene. <laughs> I don't behave like that, I swear. I don't. Well, maybe sometimes, and then I'm a fool. Um, I'm, I can be tough on characters based on people I know. Oh, no, I skipped something. Wait, Jane is depressed because she feels she has nothing left to look forward to. She feels old and irrelevant and is pretty angry about it. She wants justice. Not that I can imagine what that feels like. Um, okay, show this uh, scene from Friends with Money. See, if you act like that, you look like an idiot. Um, 
I can be tough on the characters uh, based on the people I know. She's based on a friend of mine for sure. But I'm tougher on myself. That doesn't make it okay to take my friend's crazy behavior and use it, but I do it anyway. <laughs> carefully though, carefully, most of them are happy to lend themselves to me, some are not. In the end, I'm writing about my own blind spots, my own immaturity, and my own unlikable qualities. The character in Please Give that you've already seen some of, Ann Gilbert playing, is based on my granny. I mean, I made Ann Gilbert look like my, that was my granny up there. Um, and so I just, I wanted to show you a scene that was kind of reminiscent of my grandma, but she wasn't, well anyway, just watch it. <laughs> it's funny watching that, I feel like it is like my shadow. It's the stuff I'd want to say to my grandma, but I wouldn't. Um, she did talk about her aging body a lot and in complete denial, um, and it made me sad. And so I get Amanda Pete to scream at her for me. <laughs> Over the years, people have said to me that I should get out of my own head and life and write about things I don't know. Why don't you mix it up? Challenge yourself, you know, write a thriller. And it makes me question myself like I'm not a real writer unless I make everything up. But if it's so satisfying for me to write the way I do, why should I do it someone else's way? Yes, if I make bigger movies that I have more money and better goodie bags. I love goodie bags, but I'd rather stick to what I'm doing. No one should ever listen to anyone anyway. As William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. And it's absolutely true. There's no right or wrong way. There's only your own way. And it is ironic that as I am writing this speech, I'm not writing a new script. Um, I can't. I've been stuck and blocked and I'm afraid I'll never write another script again. My friends tell me that every time, that I say that every time, and, but there is a time when it will be that time, and how do I know this isn't it? When I'm writing, I feel alive and valuable and grounded, and when I don't, I don't feel those things very much. It's hard to believe that something will come, but I'm gonna trust and hope that it will because making movies helps me feel that life and all of its fucked up beauty is more than the sum of its parts. That's the end. <laughs>I get a cushion. Do you want one? Yeah. There you go. Very saggy chair. But very writerly. Oh, we're going to pretend we're like in a little salon. I've just realized why I have the cushion on this seat. Oh, I'm do you want it? Sinking. <laughs> Over the course of the next 40 minutes, I'll yeah. disappear. <laughs> um, yes, I like being upright. <laughs> you, you've talked about um, your work as a writer-director. Um, there's an enormous body of work as well uh, that you've directed um, for television. If you don't mind, I'm going to stay mostly with your work as a writer-director, but also your work as, as a writer. Um, I have total faith and trust that your career is going to continue as a writer-director, um, because I don't think anyone who's written the body of work that you have so far will, will just come to a halt. I just think... Well, maybe, maybe I'll just start writing some really bad ones. <laughs> it happens. But with, with the idea of, of a career continuing... Um, yeah. I'm quite curious about the Holofsner extended household. Perhaps starting off with your sons, mm. when you announce that you're writing a new script, mm -hmm. is there a sense of nervousness in your family of like, oh God, what's mum gonna do next? Or um, No, I don't think so, because I don't, I don't go bananas or become a drunk or do anything like horrible that my kids would be upset about. It's more like, I think I have an idea, what's it about? I'm like, oh, I don't know, I can't tell you yet. <laughs> Um, so no, you know, they don't care that much. Um, I've, I've read a number of interviews um, where you talk about your upbringing and you had some quite incredible experiences within the film industry uh -huh. um, because of your family. Um, there was, there's one amazing one about Warren Beatty. We're not going to talk about it here. You have to go off and research oh, that one. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> but it, it struck me, aside of um, Friends With Money and Jason Isaac and Catherine Keener's couple who, mm -hmm. who are writers, yeah. um, 
you've dealt with artists, you've dealt with um, therapists, masseurs, but you mm -hmm. haven't indulged in the Hollywood world. Have mm -hmm. you ever been tempted? To write to, about Hollywood? Yeah. Uh, def definitely. Um, but I haven't come up with a story yet. I had an idea about a famous person stand in or, you know, an assistant to a crazy actress, um, which would be really fun for about 20 pages. And then I don't know what's supposed to happen next, that it doesn't become silly and ridiculous, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting, crazy business. I mean, I love movies that are about the movie business. I love The Player, Day for Night, yep. which I have not seen in a really long time. But that made me want to make movies that were really fun. It's interesting, that idea of fun, because um, I was saying earlier that um, one of the great pleasures of being asked to host this event specifically um, is indulging in your work over the course of the last two weeks, and it's been an absolute joy to that's, watch your films. That's good. Um, and it, it, it struck me that we shouldn't have to pigeonhole a director, writer, director in, in, in one single area. Mm -hmm. um, but reading a number of interviews and profiles of you, um, people talk about romantic comedies, which I think is completely incorrect. Mm. And then there's Ariel Levy's profile of you for The New Yorker, which mm -hmm. is entitled Human Comedies. And I thought mm -hmm. that's an absolutely spot on mm -hmm. description of your work. Mm -hmm. Because your films are very funny, but I would never think of them as comedies. Uh -huh. They're Good. dramas with humor in them. Right. How do you see them? Um, I would call it a comedy drama. It just is a shorthand, but the drama in, this mo in those movies are so is so important to me. It's great to get a laugh, but you know if I can move someone to tears, then I'm really happy, <laughs> um, or just feel really moved by something. Um, and um, I don't know. I, I I can't help being funny. I. I it's like I write a sad scene. I don't mean that in some obnoxious way, but it's like I'll write a sad scene and suddenly I've made some jokes, you know? And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, but I guess I like to lighten things up. I hate melodrama. I just hate that. So we had um, Taika Waititi speaking about his process um, earlier today. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the fact that it's much harder to write comedy than mm. it is to write straight-hand drama. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about your process. You've talked about where you draw your ideas from. Right. Um, but the actual nuts and bolts of it, your daily process, are you someone who is regimented? You sit down, you won't leave a table until you've written so much? Um, it's sporadic. I mean, having raised kids, it's hard. And I will avoid writing at all, you know, in any way possible. You know, the laundry and the whatever. Um, now there's online shopping, which is really fucked. Because <laughs> then you're in, the, you're doing it, and it's right there. You know, I type on the computer, and then you get those pop-ups, and it's like, oh, a sale. Um, my, my ideal thing, and I've done it from the start, is to get up early and write for a couple of solid hours. That's, that's a good day for me. If I can focus, and sometimes I can get many pages written, um, um, and sometimes I don't, and sometimes I don't do the two hours or the three hours. When I'm rewriting something, either for a job or for myself, that I can sit there a lot longer, and time goes by faster. But writing an original is so kind of depleting, coming up with ideas that I just have to fall asleep. <laughs> and you sometimes with a pen in my hand, though. Has your writing process changed over time? Or? Not really, no. I mean, in the beginning, I tried to follow what I was told in school. You know, the 30 pages first act, and the wants, and the protagonists, and the all that. Which are valid things, but I couldn't follow, like, if I plotted it out and put the cards up on the wall, I got bored. And, and also, when I'd get to write the scene, I wouldn't regard the cards. I just like, oh, that's a boring thing, and I'll just write it anyway, differently. So I don't do that, and I just, like I said, I just come up with an idea and um, take some notes about characters, usually, and then blend them together with some kind of, hopefully, a plot or a situation. Um, and uh, there I go. And um, like, it's easy to get stuck that way, and but I like it. Are you someone who has a repository of ideas, of scenarios, because it's interesting watching all of your films together. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and, and seeing the way that you map out the narratives, and obviously they are character-driven mm -hmm. and utterly credible characters, characters we'd imagine seeing on the street every day. But there are certain scenarios that I wonder, ah, actually, was that something that you had from a while back and in oh. a drawer or something and you bring mm -hmm. it out? Right. Or are all these scenes specific to the film that you're writing? I, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a drawer full of ideas. I really wish I did. Um, I, I could make a drawer of bad ideas that I would never end up writing, but no, I have to kind of wait for an idea or inspiration and, um, for instance, the script that I'm not writing anymore. You know, I did have inspiration. I was really excited and I got to 30 and it was terrific and then I just couldn't get past 30. Uh, it's easy to get to 30, right? It's like, you know, you set everything up, it's fun and then, okay. How do you keep everyone awake? Um, so, was that your question, kind of? Yeah, it's been I the mean, same, yeah. But also, within that process, mm -hmm. um, you, you talk about plot, and it's, it, it's very interesting. I think there, there are certain genres that, that people take, particularly critics, might take for granted and say, well, mm -hmm. you know, this is a relationship drama. It's, it's, it's what you expect. Right. And again, looking at your work, there's something quite radical that happens. Really? Um, I, plot wise, mm -hmm. I, I just feel that you see the plot as being far less important mm -hmm. to character and, and characters in situations. Mm -hmm. And so what I find really fascinating watching your films is the character arcs of your films. There's not the grand arc where there is this epiphanal redemptive moment right. at the end of a film. Yeah, she buys her kids jeans. Yeah, but that's, that's really like interesting. the epitome There's of... A shift. <laughs> And it, it feels like it's the everyday that you're dealing with. Uh -huh. not, it's the ordinary, not the extraordinary. Right. But in itself, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Yeah. Well, like with Friends with Money, that makes me think of that. Like, the idea started with the fact that my good friend bought the apartment next door to hers in Manhattan and had to wait for this old woman to die so that they could break through. I'm sure it happens here. And, um, and I thought, this is crazy. And my friend would bring her lasagna, and yet it was all under this relationship. It's like, are you dead yet? <laughs> when can I get in there? And she wouldn't die. It took a really long time. And <laughs> I thought, what a crazy idea. And then, but that wouldn't have been enough. Then it was like, OK, so they're neighbors. And the grandchildren you know, feel like they're you know, uh, bloodsuckers. Um, and so that gave me all this great stuff to work with you know, neighbors who have two diff very different agendas. And uh, yeah. But then that, in a, in a way, taps into what you were saying earlier about trusting people to tell you the truth and be honest with the truth. Mm -hmm. And I thought you've given us an example uh, a moment ago um, of an instance where, where someone is, is being truthful. Mm -hmm. but in Friends With Money, you've got Jason Isaac's character that we've seen with the house building. Um, and he comments on the size of his wife, uh, Catherine Keener's ass, saying how big it's gotten. And it's very interesting because that it seems that you, you do say, OK, this is a spectrum. Right. And on this spectrum, you can go too far. Right. That was just, that was just plain mean. Um, you know, and their marriage is ending, and she says he has horrible breath, and they just kind of go at each other. Um, so yeah, there's truth, and then there's truth. You know, I think it's, I can probably be too brusque with my friends. She said she read this speech. I said, I want your opinion. And she's like, oh God, I remember what you said to me. <laughs> and she was like, do I have any cellulite on my thighs? And I said, yeah, you got a lot of cellulite. And she was like stunned, and I don't remember saying that, but she didn't, she wasn't mad at me. Because again, it was kind of like that. She knew she had it. I wasn't going to say she didn't have it. So within that. I can talk about cellulite, <laughs> pee, what other <laughs> disgusting things. Oh, I've got a checklist here. We'll be okay, good. <laughs> over the next 10 minutes. Um, but within that, and again, it, it, this to me crosses um, all the six films that, that you've made. Mm -hmm. The idea that. Um, audience sympathy that's not earned is an overrated cinematic virtue. The audience sympathy in, in so many films is yeah. something that's taken for granted by a filmmaker, and mm -hmm. it strikes me that's not... You're happy to present characters who might be slightly misanthropic, mm -hmm. and by the end of the film, we don't necessarily love them. Mm -hmm. 
but there's at least an understanding for mm -hmm. them. And that's, that's quite unique mm -hmm. for someone who, who's exploring that throughout much of their work. That's probably why I have a small career. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, don't, I like ambiguous endings. You know, I mean, my goal is I want you to like all the characters at the end. I do. Um, even in Land of Steady Habits, when Ben Mendelsohn does some rotten things, um, I want you to still like him. I, I just, because I love these people and they're highly flawed and they fuck up big time. But I don't know, I still really, I have compassion for them. Um, I'm trying to think who I don't have compassion for in my movies. I don't know. Um, staying with the uh, Land of Steady Habits, which okay. is um, now on Netflix, um, available to watch. And you mentioned Ben Mendelsohn. Um, quite a bit of, has been written uh, about the fact that this is your first male central protagonist mm -hmm. in one of your films. But watching it, it struck me, um, and you, you've gone, we're going into the realms of Goddard-esque and Tarantino-esque here. Thank he you. is a very <laughs> Holofcenarian character. And so right. watching it, I thought, well, okay, yes, this is, this is a male central character, mm -hmm. but this is very much in keeping with all the other characters. Yeah, it didn't, that's why I was drawn to the book. I adapted it from a novel. And yeah, I just, I felt like he was really screwed up and makes some reprehensible mistakes. Um, but he's funny and still charming and learns and is a buffoon, a great big one. Um, and, you know, he, it's much darker than my other movies in terms of what happens. And I totally understand when people say they don't forgive him or, you know, they couldn't get behind the character because he was so unlikable. But um, I get that. And I knew when I was making it, it was like that. But I actually told Ben, I was like, you're my Catherine Keener. Like he was just, I, I, I felt like I was directing a woman. And he was very flattered that I said that. <laughs> he could take it. Um, you know, he's really sensitive. It's also interesting in that you follow on from working with James Gandolfini, who we saw a moment ago. Both Ben and James in your films are completely cast against type. Right. That must have been quite interesting, just playing with their persona. Yeah, um, it was. I mean, people, you know, can, he, can that actor do that? You know, I've never seen Ben in a room, you know, be a nice person or sort of a nice person. <laughs> um, but that's exciting. You know, it's a risk, but actually it's not a risk. People would say, you really took a chance on Jim, James Gandolfini, you know? And it's like, no, you watch The Sopranos, that guy can do anything, and he's heartbreaking. Um, so, yeah, it's fun. And do you enjoy the actual casting process? Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like, did I say that out loud? It's really stressful. I mean, it's exciting when, you know, I call Ben Mendelsohn, he's like, yeah. Um, I can't believe he said yes, you know. Um, but some actors take forever, or I can't find what I want, um, or, you know, the worst case scenario is that the studio wants me to cast someone else, and I don't want to cast somebody else. And I'll, I'll kind of make a compromise, like, okay, I'll, I'll offer it to that big star and that big star, but not that big star. And then they don't get back, or they are busy, or they want more money. And I mean, in terms of Netflix, it, it was at uh, Fox Searchlight, and I developed it there. But we couldn't agree on a cast. And I said, I want Ben Mendelsohn. They were like, we can't do that. He's a great actor, but we can't do that. So Netflix agreed to do it. So it's like casting is hard. It's yeah. hard because usually I want to cast like Mike Lee. You know? <laughs> I want like buck toothed people. <laughs> and, you know, the zits and the whatever, the real thing, but I can't. Um, in the film, you've got um, Edie Falker, who's wonderful, playing Ben Mendelsohn's ex-wife. Yeah. And I wondered if at any point in time you had a phone conversation with her, um, sort of akin to uh, Gregory Peck being offered a comedy and him on the phone going, so is Cary Grant not available or something? Mm -hmm. Did you have a conversation with Edie Falker where she went, yes, yeah, so is Catherine busy or right, what, yeah. what's going on? Um, I don't know if Edie, she probably did. She was like, why me? What? Um, and I just, I love Edie. I've loved her for years, wanted to work with her. And I don't even know if Catherine was busy, but 
we have an understanding, you know. She's like, you can actually cast someone else. <laughs> and, um, and I did. And, you know, it's just I want to sometimes work with other people. I do. Um, and we'll, I'll come back to Catherine, I'm sure. Yep. And Julia, I hope. Um, another person in the film, uh, yeah. Land of Steady Habits, is, is Connie Britton. Mm -hmm. And her character highlights something, again, you can see in all of your work. And it comes back to your writing process that I'm curious about. I could be wrong, and I'm perhaps being a little pejorative here, but if The Land of Steady Habits had been made by a male director, mm -hmm. I get the sense that the female characters would have been bit parts mm -hmm. and nothing more. Mm -hmm. And Connie Britton is this woman that Anders, the main character, meets. Mm -hmm. She's only in a couple of scenes, but she is a fully fleshed out character. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious within your writing process about the attention mm -hmm. that you play um, to so many different characters like mm -hmm. that. Well, some male directors some. are brilliant, and some male directors might just shove them under the rug. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. I just, if I'm, I'm pretty aware if I'm writing a character that has no personality, you know, um, and I struggle, like, I got to give this person a personality. You know, they're just kind of standing there, and sometimes I'll just cut them out um, if it's not working and I can't, because they, they just got to be interesting and hold people, men or women. Um, I just, you know, all my movies I get, not always, but, you know, critics will say, like, she gives short shrift to the male characters, and why not, you know, da, da, da. And, and then I did Land of Steady Habits, and I got, she gives short shrift to the female characters. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, some people have smaller parts. What are you going to do? Um, it's also the, another element that um, you can see in all of your work is, is a really strong sense of place. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this even includes Can You Ever Forgive Me, which um, opens here early next year, which you mm -hmm. wrote, not directed. Mm -hmm. But in the writing, you get such a sense of early 1990s New York. Mm -hmm. And can you talk, and in the case of Land of Steady Habits, we've got Massachusetts, and mm -hmm. obviously the other films, New York and, and LA. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you incorporate? I, you know, it's not something I think about. It's like where it takes place, and then the characters are just in that place. Like, I mean, I didn't write, I adapted uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me from a memoir. And in the memoir, it's very clear that it was in the 90s, and it's this bar and that street and where she lives. And um, so I didn't have to create that so much. Um, but uh, in um, Land of Steady Habits is Westport, Connecticut. And you know, I don't, I don't know from that. You know, I'm Jewish. <laughs> I don't, if you don't know Westport. I was like the only Jew there. I'm kidding, it's not that bad. But, you know, it's very waspy, and you know, men wear shorts with little whales on them and stuff. <laughs> and um, and so I had a costume designer. She just did a bunch of research, and you know, showed me pictures, and was like, oh, I like that hideous sweater. Oh, I like that Brooks Brothers suit. You know, every department really helped in that way, and I really wanted the houses to look very different. You know, like Edie's house is warm, and um, the family house, you know, with history and his place is cold and sterile and new. Um, but I was also very limited um, in terms of exteriors because we shot New York for Connecticut. We, we couldn't shoot in Connecticut and it was freezing. So we kind of um, didn't do that much. But I'm thrilled when people say, oh, it really feels like Westport, Connecticut. Like, how did you get that? Like you just said. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't entirely buy that because really? the thing of that, well, no, the thing about your writing is that it's, it strikes me that the way that you approach class, which doesn't exist in America apparently, and, oh, no. and economics, and even occasionally when you, you touch on race and touching on politics, mm -hmm. you, there is such a very specific sense of place mm -hmm. that you get in your work. Well, I love that stuff. I mean, anything, you know, class and race and anything that's taboo to talk about, like money or race or politics, um, that's really fun to write and really fun to direct, I find. Um, and so if that gives it a, you know, a sense of place, maybe, or fills out their lives, 
in a way. I think I know what you're saying. And have you, have you felt any sort of reaction within your writing process of, we saw um, your short from 1991, so mm -hmm. we are moving from a Republican president through to a Democrat president, through yeah. to a Republican, then Democrat, and what there is now. Um, <laughs> a, dict I, a dictator, yeah, I mean? You said it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious if, about the impact of that as you're writing, uh -huh. of the, the way that climates have changed. I think I'm way too self-absorbed <laughs> to put that in my writing. I mean, it's in, my, it's in our world, it's in my head, but I'm not writing about that stuff. I'm just not. Um, other people do very well, but I stick to the human uh, details. So with that idea of self-absorption, um, <laughs> something yeah. that I noticed, well, there's one obvious scene between two characters, um, Charlie Tan and Ben Mendelsohn's character, the last scene that they have together, which oh. you watch. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of parallel play, that this, this is something that I see in a lot of scenes in your film where you, mm -hmm. you have two people talking, mm -hmm. and they might be hearing, but they're not listening. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's something you do so well Thank in you. your work. Thank you. Um, it's never uh, happened to me before. I mean, <laughs> I mean, half of me, people are not listening to anybody half the time. I mean, most people are, not most people, but I, you know, I find it very difficult when I can tell someone is just thinking about what they're going to say next. I mean, I've even had interviewers, which you are not one of, you're terrific, but like, they'll be like, they'll have their pen and their paper and they'll be like, you know, so, um, you, you know, you write about uh, this male character who is, you know, obnoxious. And I start to answer, and then they're like this. And then I'm looking at them like, well, who am I talking to? It's, it's just really uncomfortable. And that's sort of the, the biggest example of that, you know, because most people will just, you know, whatever. Um, but that scene in particular, I did want parallel play um, in the boat. You know, they're not... They need each other in some crazy way, and they're both so immature and sad and lonely. But they're not really talking to each other, and they have absolutely nothing in common, um, which I think is what makes Ben eventually say, like, we got to get out of here. Um, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. No, it's, it, one of the things that, uh, and particularly in that conversation, certain things that Ben says, I, mm -hmm. again, there's this idea that of the ordinary, the everyday, that I could imagine hit someone on the street saying something like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, Taika Waititi earlier on today uh, mentioned that he's an eavesdropper. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. How much of an eavesdropper? I don't run around with a pad, but I remember some certain things, and I will go home and write them, or if I have a pad or a phone. But um, that's the most entertaining thing. And now my, my thing is like looking over people's shoulders when they're on their phone. <laughs> like if you go to a movie, everybody's on their phone first, and you can just like watch the bullshit that everybody's doing, or you know, interesting conversations, or they're flipping through their Instagram, and it's such a way in to their lives. Um, but I, yeah, the, the stuff people say, it's just you can't make that shit up. Let's um, take some questions from the audience if we can raise the lights. And we've got some roaming mics. So there's someone down here, and then anyone further back? Yeah, and someone right at the back. So we'll go this one here first, and then back row. Hi, Nicole. Hi. So, um, how did you get through your writer's block before, and what are you going to do to get through your writer's block now that you've got? Well, I guess you're supposed to just keep writing. But, and so when I was writing the script that I can't finish, I just kept writing and write scenes, and I would get to page 80, and then I'd read it, and it was bad, and then I did that a few times, and then finally I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I gave in to the writer's block. And I felt immediately relieved, because um, I just couldn't nail it. And I'm sad, and I'm scared. And I don't plan on going back to that. Uh, I might take pieces eventually out of it, because I think there's some good stuff in there. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I can work, thank God, in TV, directing other people's stuff, which I really like. And I'm reading things like books and scripts that I could direct and adapt. Um, but those are, you know, mostly money, 
money jobs. I, I enjoy doing them, but it's not the same. So I'm kind of looking around for what might be next. And um, that's how. In Do, other words, I, I don't know how. <laughs> does the freelance directing help in any way in sort of freeing you away from your own Absolutely. creative process? Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. And if it's a show I really love, then I'm so excited to be there. And also, like, ultimately, I mean, unless I really screw up, it's not my fault. Because <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm directing somebody else's material. The writers and producers are right behind me. And so after every take, I, or after the end of a scene, I'll turn around and say, can I move on? Are you happy with that? And if they say yes, then it's not my <laughs> fault. Um, and so, uh, and plus I get to meet new people, new actors I want to work with, and, and directors, and I mean, other crew members. Um, but it is a relief. And that's why I want to do that now. I want a job, so I don't have to think about this. But writing is the most satisfying thing, or having written is the most satisfying <laughs> thing. Finishing a script is thrilling. Yep. Um, I was interested to hear um, and to read about earlier your... Where are you? Um, at the back. Right at the back. Hi. Hi. Um, your early experiences um, working on Woody Allen sets um, uh, and Hannah and her sisters as an assistant editor. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering... Um, how maybe some of that has influenced you, if at all, because yeah. both of you kind of have uh, a very kind of like personal um, cinema um, and autobiographical in, in some ways and uh -huh. it's there. I think um, uh, my relationship with Woody Allen is completely overblown in so many publications. Like he was not my mentor, he was not a close friend, you know. And when I worked on Hannah and her sisters, I was an apprentice editor. I just sunk the dailies, which us old people will know what that means. Um, you know, and I interacted with him, and he, he you know, was a family friend-ish. But um, I think that I was inspired by him just like everybody else. It's not because I knew him. Um, I just loved his movies, especially the earlier, old, older ones. <laughs> Sorry, Woody. Um, but they're still unbelievably hilarious and, and beautiful, those older ones. Um, you know, many other directors like Mike Lee and Albert Brooks and a lot of filmmakers who wrote really personal stuff. You could feel it was personal. Um, all that inspired me. Then, you know, I think seeing Sex, Lies, and Videotape when I was in film school really blew me away because that felt like, I mean, I don't know if, any of that stuff happened to Steven Soderbergh, it probably did. But um, it was so normal and regular and slow and quiet and um, felt so real that those kind of movies inspired me too. Yeah. Someone here and then we'll go to the front and then over this side, so yes. Hi, Nicole. Um, hi. Where um, are I you? was wondering, Where are you? Where? just here. Oh, sorry, hi. Hello. I was wondering what your views are on the changing landscape of films in terms of Netflix and Amazon Prime. Because um, it strikes me that your kind of films and these sort of more grown up comedy dramas or even romantic comedies that yeah. I feel like if Save One's a screenwriter is coming through, that this seems to be now the home for these kind of movies. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just wondered what your thoughts were on the, that, that sort of, you know, in a way, presumably that's exciting, there's a bigger landscape, but does it mean that? you know, these sort of movies won't be seen in cinemas so much. And does that, would it, does it bother you where your films are seen, for mm -hmm. example? Well, I'd much prefer have, to have my movies in a movie theater. I knew that Land of Steady Habits was going to be a tough one, you know, unless George Clooney was in it. And even then, based on the material. Um, but I wanted it to be screened in a theater. And then when Netflix said I could cast anyone I wanted, I didn't care about the theater anymore. I was like, that's the point I want to make a movie I'm proud of. Um, and so I got to do that. Um, now that I've done that, it is a very strange experience. It's sort of like I made a movie and then it blew away. I, got, I don't know where it is, and I don't see people watching it. And you know, they have a very different model of um, press and, and um, long lead advertising. Like nobody knew this movie existed a week and a half before it was released. Um, they're like, you made a new movie? I was like, yeah, there's no trailer, there's no this or that, like months in advance, nothing. They blast it all at once, like 
two weeks before it's released. And then it goes away. And so, um, again, I, I might go that route again because it let me make a movie I'm proud of. But, and so I think the landscape, it's good and bad. You know, obviously anybody can make a movie now and that's great. It's not so, you know, elitist and hard to break into, but, you know, just like, you know, I'm like an old lady. It's like the iPhones and the, you know, nobody's looking at each other and the movie theaters are going away. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, Hi, yeah. You mentioned that you don't know what's going to happen when you're starting to write your first draft. Yeah. How much do you need to know before you're ready to plunge in? And is the process of writing your first draft something you just blast in a couple of weeks or anguish over many, many months? That one. <laughs> I wish I could be one of those. We banged it out in two weeks. It's like, I hate you. <laughs> Who are you? Um, I write, I start writing when I get bored taking notes. Like I'll make up a bunch of characters and a few scenes and I get an idea of maybe what the end might be like. Um, and then I just start writing and I get completely lost generally after a while. And that's when rewriting and rewriting and rewriting helps. Um, and do you, do you go back to the beginning of what you've written and keep changing? As yeah. You, so you're, so in a way, you're doing a new draft each time. Yeah, I don't know how people count drafts. You know, I think sometimes, I mean, I'll do, I'll, I'll do that to a point. Um, and then eventually, I, it is, does feel like a first draft still. And then once I, like, I, oh, this is about that, then I can rewrite it. Um, but I do go over it. It's impossible not to see what you did yesterday. Go here, um, yep. Nicole, thank you very much for an enlightening chat. I like your honesty today. I think it's great. Thank you. My question is about the actual... Well, two things. is obviously about putting your package together for your films. And the second thing is about using an actress's bankability to actually get your film made. Because obviously there are certain actresses, say, like the Emma Stones and Jennifer Lawrence, who are the names that can open a movie. But you're using Catherine Kinn. I mean, how, what's the general feeling if you're trying to get your films made do you can you rely on a bankability of an actress like a name like that and would they consider a, one of your scripts um i think certain actors would definitely consider my scripts i mean i get so impatient and frustrated if somebody is taking too long to read the script i feel like i'll you know i'll find someone who wants to read it right away and i i offered a part to kate winslet I think it was, I don't even remember which movie it was. And I would love her and really wanted her to do it and it was taking forever, like a couple of months was going by. And I told my agent like, let's just pull it back. Let's tell her we're moving on. And then I ran into her like the week later and she was like, I was about to read your movie and you took it away from me. So I don't have patience. Um, and but I, sure, I mean, I love Emma Stone. I love a lot of famous people and I would love to work with them. Well, you know, they're busy. And I, I do have some of those famous people who say I wanna be in one of your movies. I mean, Melissa McCarthy and I have wanted to work together for a really long time. But um, I'm not, I guess I'm just, I'm not like a, a sellout. I don't wanna put somebody in the movie just cause they're famous. They have to be really right for it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what is it that you enjoy the most about the writing process and what is it that you dread the most that you feel you're struggling with the most? Um, the writing, well, I don't know when I'm, when I'm reading it, something I've written and I'm laughing or I think, I'm clever. <laughs> <laughs> this was good. Um, and finish, having finished it is the most satisfying. But like if I have a good day, I mean, it's just so terrible how much it affects my self-esteem and my worldview. It's like if I wrote a, a good day, I feel really good, you know? Um, and if I'm struggling, and it's always a struggle though, I guess discipline, I feel bad when I'm not disciplined. Um, I find myself pushing it off. Um, and that makes me feel bad, so why don't I do it every day? I don't know. <laughs> it's a conundrum. Um, hi, Nicole. Uh, so hi. you mentioned that um, 
a lot of your characters are based on your real experiences and you mm -hmm. draw on your relationships with others. Is there ever a fear of the, um, the backlash that comes mm -hmm. with that if somebody yeah. watches a piece of your work and thinks, takes offense to the way that they feel they've been portrayed and how do you mm -hmm. deal with that? Um, well, it hasn't happened very often. I, have, I did like, show one of my scripts to the character that the, you know, she's being portrayed and read the script and said, no, this is great, I'm fine with it. And then when she saw the movie, oh my God. Um, I really hurt her feelings. Um, it wasn't a flattering portrait of her. Um, and I felt really bad, I did. And um, other times, I'm, uh, I try not to. I did have one friend who didn't want to see the movie because he knew he was kind of in it. Um, and I don't think he would have minded it, but he was kind of anxious about it. I mean, I would love to just write so honestly about my family and the craziness and the shit, you know, all of it. But I, I can't do that. I don't, I can't, it's not worth it. Until they go. Until they're dead. <laughs> yeah. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. We've been very quiet. We've got someone at the back. Hi there. Um, I have a question about when you're writing a script and then you turn up on set and when you're directing a scene, do you find there's a difference between what you've written and what you find in the moment? Or how do you approach that? Um, well, of course, you know, we picture it in our heads when we're writing completely, and then you get to the location and it's all wrong, you know? Um, everything is different. The way an actor will say it is different, um, and usually for the better, because I've cast people I really want. Sometimes it's exactly as I pictured and I'm thrilled, but I'm open to changing things while we're shooting, and if someone says something terrific or funny, I'll take it. Um, I generally try to keep it to what I've imagined, um, and I don't know, it's, it's so weird, like I don't remember what I thought that scene was gonna look like when I wrote it, because then it becomes something else. And then when you're editing it, it becomes something else again. But it's cool being able to direct your own writing. I mean, that's, I can change it, I can do whatever I want to it. And yeah. We touched very briefly on adaptation, um, mm -hmm. but, but is that more of a challenge for you? Because I know with, um, the Land of Steady Habits, you, the focus is more on the central character mm -hmm. as his life is falling apart rather than giving lots and lots of backstory. And right. The character that Connie Britton plays is... is non-existent. Uh, non-existent yeah. in, in Ted Thompson's novel. So I, I'm just curious... You read about, it? Um, no, I read oh. an interview in which you said that. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, I, I look slightly you. cheaper than I did 30 <laughs> seconds ago. Um, but thank you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, I, I'm just curious about the, the, the sense of license, the sense of freedom you have, and yeah. obviously then the extra element if you're not actually then directing. Right. Um, well, I take license. I, I, I don't think any um, novelist should care. I mean, unless they, I don't know, don't trust me at all. Ted Thompson was so thrilled that his, movie, his book was being turned into a movie. It was his first novel. And he was already a fan of mine. And he was such a pleasure. He was like, do whatever you want. Go, go for it. Um, and I showed him drafts, and he corrected me in certain areas or made suggestions, and that was good. But adapting is easier because it's there already. Um, I haven't had to adapt like a big, fat thing and whittle it down into, you know, um, most of the stuff I've adapted is pretty manageable. And... Picking and choosing, I would just like set the book up in one of those um, recipe stands and be like, this is a good scene, that's a good scene, and just kind of do it based on what I like and what I'd like to write and what is important. Um, but it's easier, for sure, to do that. Um, and Can You Ever Forgive Me um, it was really fun to adapt her memoir it's a really funny memoir. It was kind of a challenge to figure out how to get, well, you guys haven't seen it yet, but how to get, you know, a writer on screen to be interesting while she's writing and while she's, 
all these other voices kind of that she's writing. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. What am I saying? Um, if any of you <laughs> haven't actually seen all of uh, Nicole's films that she's written and directed, all of them except her first um, Walking and Talking available to see in the UK. Hopefully that will become available again because I think it's a lovely yeah. debut. Um, Thank you. You just, can't get it anywhere. No, it's, it's, it's very odd. But I mentioned a number of times now The Land of Steady Habits. That is now available to watch on Netflix, and I strongly recommend that you watch it. It's a really beautiful piece of filmmaking. Can You Ever Forgive Me opens on the 1st of February in the UK. You get a chance to see it then. And yes, it's by a different director, but I don't think Melissa McCarthy and Richard E. Grant would be half as good if it wasn't for such a superb screenplay to that film. Thank you very much to the JJ Charitable Trust and to BAFTA for organizing this event. But Thank most you. of all, can you please join me in thanking Nicole? <laughs>